Hello everyone, and um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Paul Adepoju. I'm the community manager for the ICFJ Pamela Howard uh, Global Crisis Reporting Forum, uh, which has been uh, our effort geared towards uh, improving and expanding crisis reporting capabilities of journalists uh, from, across, uh, from across the world. Uh, crisis comes uh, in different forms and uh, formats. And uh, while some are issues you can actually physically see and uh, 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 I've already gotten these uh, ideal crisis label issues like uh, the global pandemic, uh, the crisis in Ukraine, uh, the food crisis, economic crisis, uh, insecurity, and poverty, and other issues. Um, these are easily described as crises. But we also have crises emanating from the digital world. And um, sometimes uh, these happen, and uh, very few individuals actually uh, categorize uh, these developments uh, as crises. But we've seen the effects that they can have, um, in including uh, potentially having effect on uh, uh, national elections that could have global implications. I remember when I first uh, saw the first deep fake. Uh, and uh, it was something that I felt, you know, this is too easy uh, to figure out that this is a fake video. But since the time that the fake uh, emerged till now, uh, they've advanced, they've become much more easier to pull off. And um, they are now increasingly grabbing attention because of the threat that they potentially pose to journalism and uh, how journalists may still have to struggle to make sense of these tools and uh, convince the general public about what is true and what is not true. Even though these are issues, even the journalists' goals are to really report the news, uh, we can no longer ignore the fakes and satanic media. And that is why today's webinar is focused on introducing deep fakes and synthetic media to journalists. And uh, at the end of it, we hope we'll be able to have uh, expanded your body of knowledge regarding how to properly uh, tackle issue of deep fakes and uh, subsequently next week we'll also look at how we can ethically deploy deep fakes and synthetic media in journalism and uh, we have a professional here that will be leading this conversation and uh, his name is Sam Gregory uh, who is an award-winning technologist media maker and advocate. Uh, Sam is a program director for Witness. Uh, Witness helps uh, people to use video and technology to defend human rights. Uh, founded after the Rodney King incident, uh, Witness has uh, 30 years of experience in over 100 countries where they are supporting critical use of uh, video to secure accountability and uh, reach millions of people with skills and tools. And these tools include engaging uh, technology giants uh, to, in order to on how their technology makes a difference and maximize civic participation via visual and social media. Good day, Sam. How, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Paul. Thank you for the, the very kind introduction. I'm looking forward to talking to folks about this week about the malicious side of deepfakes and next week about the, um, the, the more pro-social usages that are found in, in journalism and elsewhere. Yes, uh, that's really cool. It's, uh, it's an extensive uh, conversation that I'm personally uh, interested in because I've really been curious about how this works and uh, how, we, how it's, it, they could potentially uh, impact uh, journalism uh, as a whole. So what I would like, before we start the presentation, uh, I would like to give some uh, house rules. Uh, so if you are joining us on the Zoom platform and you have any question to ask, uh, use the Q&A uh function on the zoom platform for your questions and uh we'll get to the questions uh at the right time and uh, if you are watching this live stream on facebook and you would like to en engage with us uh use the chat box under the video that you are watching right now and we are going to address the question uh at the right time and um i would also like to know where you our audience you are from so if you can use the chat box now to engage us on where you are joining us from uh, we really like that that can also guide us in being able to listen focus some aspects of this dialogue to issues affecting your geographical area yeah does this sam are you ready i'm ready yeah thank you you can share your screen i'll join you for the interactive session Great. 
Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone um, to talk about tackling deep fakes and synthetic media in journalism. Um, as Paul explained, I'm the program director of Witness, and I lead uh, an initiative called Prepare Don't Panic that is focused on supporting an inclusive global approach to the malicious uses of deep fakes and other forms of audiovisual manipulation and on supporting innovations in media trust, provenance and authenticity. And just to contextualize for folks where I come from as, um, as a member of the witness team, uh, we work globally and a lot of our work is really supporting people to create trustworthy information. And I think when we look at deep fakes and we start to think about the solutions, part of the solution is of course, how we reinforce an ecosystem of trustworthy information. Now that in witnesses case um, is often human rights defenders and citizen journalists on the front lines of conflict and of state violence. Um, for example, right now in Ukraine, where we are sharing guidance on how to document in a more trustworthy evidentiary way and have done so in the past in many other co contexts globally. Um, we have to start from this trustworthy information perspective. At the same time, in the witness context, we've seen that um, there is a constant battle between trustworthy information and deceptive information. So a significant part of our work as a human rights organization that works with civic journalists and citizen journalists is also to find ways to uh, challenge misinformation and support the creation of more verifiable information. So, you know, flashing up on the screen at the moment, some of the work we do around visual verification. And we do this also thinking from a tools layer. So we've collaborated over the years with groups like the Guardian Project to build tools like Proof Mode. It's an easy way to add rich metadata to a photo or video and cryptographically hash it so that you can show where it came from that it hasn't been tampered with. And of course, the context of all of this and human rights defenders and journalists face the same problem is that often authorities and people in power challenge the veracity, the truth of the content we produce, particularly when it challenges that power. And I'm just flashing up here, uh, an example from the witness team in Africa, um, uh, involved in the NSARS movement there against police violence and the response of the Nigerian military who dismissed the incriminating footage as fake or falsified. So it's within this context that I wanna talk about how we tackle malicious deep fakes, this new form of audiovisual manipulation. And Witness has done this over the past four years in this Prepare Don't Panic initiative. We were, in fact, the first organization I know of to bring together journalists and technologists and human rights defenders across the globe to really talk about the needs, the threats, and the desired solutions. And if you go to our webpage, you can find many different resources that look at regional needs at different aspects. So I encourage you really to dig in um, and learn more at the website you see at the bottom of the page here. And the work very much comes from what we describe as this prepare, don't panic approach. What I mean by that is we're thinking very much around um, how the rhetoric around deep fakes, which is this idea that you know, deep fakes are gonna destabilize all possible truth in or possible belief in images and video is already creating its own harms. And I'm gonna come back to that later as one of the real challenges that journalists and others face is the destabilizing rhetoric around deep fakes and the way it lends itself to people in power to claim that true video is false is already a problem and is likely to get worse. So we really need to focus on not panicking, but preparing. And then the second place we start from is, in fact, in the area of deep fakes, there are a lot of people who want to solve this problem. They want to solve for deep fakes, but are they listening to the right range of people globally with lived and expert experience? And one of the key constituencies in our work and We've done this work with the BBC and Western journalists. We've done it in Brazil, in South Africa, in Myanmar, in Southeast Asia, in Sub-Saharan Africa, is centering journalists as one of the key groups who need to really identify what they need in this emerging landscape. So um, I'm gonna cover three areas in the discussion today. I wanna do first a brief introduction to deep fakes so people understand what we're talking about in terms of technologies. Then I'm gonna talk about the threats uh, that are emerging um, and how they relate to journalism. And then I'm going to talk about the solutions. Uh, and then next week I'll be back and we'll be talking around kind of the pro-social usages of deep fakes and synthetic media for journalism and related spaces. So first of all, what are deep fakes? Um, let me show a couple of examples on this slide of media items produced with 
what are known as deep fakes and synthetic media, which is sort of broader category that we might think of. And this shows really the range of what you can do with these types of technologies. So on the left, you just saw an animated photo. This is my great grandmother. She is colorized, she is animated. Uh, this was just done on a website called Deep Nostalgia. Very simple, I just dropped in a photo. This is the most easy way of using these tools, using a photo, making it move. The second one on this page. This is a deep fake made in a commercial app. In fact, a commercial app uh, located in Ukraine, Reface, uh, which made it possible for anyone to put their face in Zelensky's body. In this case, I put Tom Cruise's face. So this is the middle part of the deep fake spectrum, the ability to use commercial apps to do things like face swap. And then the final video I want to show is this one you made. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? And this is the high end of deepfakes production. This is a face swap of Tom Cruise, the actor's face, onto a, uh, a very talented impersonator, um, and then with sort of visual effects applied afterwards. So on the left-hand side, the simplest form of synthetic media, highly easy, highly accessible, relies on one image into a model that's already been trained. On the right-hand side, this took real work. They had to really train and customize a deepfake tool to create this very convincing replica of the actor Tom Cruise. Um, and all of these tools What's up to work um, essentially with some similarities. They're built on the latest AI and machine learning approaches that take training data. In the case of these ones, training data would be images of faces or of a faces or videos of a particular person. And they place them into um, algorithms that um, in many cases compete to create better and better fakes based on those data, right? So people often analogize this to a cat and mouse game, uh, which means that uh, what they mean by that is you have one AI um, system that, for example, is trying to create a forgery of Tom Cruise's face, and then another AI system that's trying to detect it. Every time it detects the forgery, the forger improves, and then back and forth in this cat and mouse game of making a better and better version of, for example, the face of Tom Cruise. And I'm not going to go into the technical details of this. Suffice to say, there are many different ways you can structure those algorithms, improve them in order to achieve what you want. So what can we do with these technologies? Um, I'm gonna highlight a few things that are happening in this technical space. Um, some of them have not been used extensively in malicious ways. Um, others are starting to be used maliciously and in ways that implicate journalism and the practice of journalism. So um, one area which is very commonplace is the idea of object edits. What this means is when you use a tool like Adobe Photoshop or a Google Pixel, um, magic camera function, you can erase something in a video, right? Like as I show here, uh, erasing the car and the bicyclist video. Uh, you can do things like change the background or the context of a scene, right? In this case, um, this is not a recent video, it's actually from four or five years ago, adding snow to the image on the right. So making a non-snowy landscape look snowy. Um, and again, this is fairly established technology. You can transfer the expressions on someone's face from one person, say a real person, to a representation of a real person. So in this video um, snapshot, you're seeing an actor making, in that case, Donald Trump's face move in alignment with him going like this. Um, and you can do things that are about transferring motions. So I just showed an example or described something where we're talking about taking someone's face expressions and transferring them to a sort of digital puppet. Well, you can do that with motion as well. So in this case, um, this is work that shows how you transfer uh, the motions of a professional dancer to a digital puppet, making them dance like that professional dancer. These have generally not been used maliciously to date these techniques, but they exist and they're often quite highly um, commercialized. For example, those sort of photo edits. Um, let me move to the first area that we start to see being used maliciously, including in the realm of news and journalism, uh, is the area of generating fake faces. This is a fairly um, baseline set of 
uh, technologies that continue to be improved. Uh, this graphic is in fact from 2018 and shows you the improvement over the course of in that case five years in the technologies to make a face of someone who never existed. So these are representations of a face of a human who never existed. Um, and it's likely that uh, folks on this call will have encountered these faces potentially in your journalism practice. We're starting to see them being used in misinformation campaigns. So instead of stealing, say, my photo from Twitter and putting it on a, um, a, sus a suspect Twitter account, you use a fake photo generator to make a realistic photo. Um, and then you use it in a misinformation account, or as we saw in Ukraine in February, you use it to, uh, as a sort of an imposter journalist behind an account. Um, and this is an area, and I'll come back to it, where we see a significant number of um, relatively low level threats occurring for journalism and a relatively significant number of solutions emerging. Um, and this technology isn't actually really about faces. It's simply about the ability to get a computer to create a realistic representation of um, an object. So, you know, there are sites online, you may be familiar with this person does not exist. You can also go to this cat does not exist, this rental does not exist, etc and create a realistic representation. And these technologies are improving quite fast. Another area that we've seen used pretty extensively in a lot of commercial development happening is what's known as lip sync dubbing. So I'm about to show a video clip in which you see uh, Mark Zuckerberg, um, the Facebook CEO, saying something he never did, but with his lips aligned with what he says. So this is about aligning the lips of someone speaking with a soundtrack. I wish I could keep telling you that our mission in life is connecting people, but it isn't. We just want to predict your future behaviors. Spectre showed me how to manipulate you into sharing intimate data about yourself and all those you love for free. The more you express yourself, the more we own you. Now, we're starting to move into the territory where you can see how this is both used and potentially used for deception. Um, now, in the case of these videos, they might be combined with a voice clone or a voice skin. So it's another area of technology that's been advancing. And really the way to think about this is a voice clone is where I train a machine to uh, speak my voice and maybe can then just enter text and it speaks in, in my voice. And a voice skin is when, um, as I speak, my voice can be changed into another voice, right? Um, and there's a huge amount of commercial development happening in this space, trying to think about things like dubbing and how do we improve the ability to, um, to translate between languages for commercial reasons. Um, so uh, important area of development, again, you can start to think about how this might be used maliciously or in ways that are deceptive. Um, and then finally, I wanna come back to the face swap. And I started at the beginning with this Tom Cruise face swap. And, and I think the important thing to emphasize is as we look at how journalists need to think about this is the face swap deep fakes remain the hardest to do, the hardest to do very quickly, the hardest to do in complex situations. So they, although we think a lot about deep fakes as face swaps and very hyper realistic face swaps, it still is the hardest part of this spectrum to do and requires the most resources at the moment. So as you're thinking about it, you know, you should be thinking about these set of emerging possibilities with deep fakes. You know, you can alter video just like with photos, like the removing an object. You can create a realistic voice or face of a human who never existed, and you can manipulate the video or audio of someone's lips, their voice, their face, their body to make it appear someone said or did something they never did. So I want to move to the next section, which is about how we think about the threats here. Um, and I think it's useful and, you know, I don't have interaction with you. If we were in a room together, I'd be watching your faces trying to think, is this audience skeptical about this? Are they really worried about this? What are they thinking? So I want you to do a mental exercise right now is have a think about the hype around deep fakes. Um, and on a scale of one to 10, ask yourself how concerned you are about AI manipulated media like deep fakes. You know, one, not concerned at all, five, kind of in the middle, 10, you didn't sleep at night last night worrying about what you'd hear today. And then you can either just keep that in your head as your frame for the rest of the talk, or you can drop it in the chat. It's always interesting to see people's range of uh, positioning on this, really, depending on their own personal experience, their professional experience, and their concerns about technology and social media. 
So ask yourself why you placed yourself at this place on the spectrum and use that as your mental framework for the rest of the talk. Now, I work on a whole range of misinformation, disinformation, fabricated media. And so I know very well that for many people, their main problem right now is not deep fakes. It's other forms of fake news, other forms of media manipulation, uh, other forms of other questions in journalism, everything from, from ownership to press, press freedom to political suppression. Um, and you, know, you might say something like, I have a thousand problems, but deep fakes aren't one of them. So as a journalist, I want to explain why you might be concerned about these and what are the threats that are emerging. So should you be concerned? Maybe the first question. And again, remember, I come from a prepare, don't panic approach. The first thing is deep fakes have had way too much hype early on that overly centered these kind of apocalyptic scenarios, scenarios of elections being thrown and compromised to what we might call as this infopocalypse idea, right? So this is an example headline from the US 2020 elections. You know, experts say deep fakes could swing the 2020 elections. I don't know who those experts were. I certainly didn't say that. I don't know people who said that. Um, and this is the type of apocalyptic description of deep fakes that actually discredits the way that the technology is improving. And what I want to tell you is that the technology is getting better, right? There are reasons to take this seriously as journalists, uh, as people concerned about mis and disinformation. And the reasons are partly technical, right? So some forms are getting progressively easier to do better with less data and without training them on a specific person. What I mean by that is you don't have to train your AI model on lots and lots of images of me to make, for example, certain manipulations of me. And audio and images are improving rapidly as well as text and multimodal, i.e. the combination of different forms of media. And increasingly, these are available on mobile, right? Like that Reface app that I mentioned, you know, you can do face swaps with hundreds of different people on that app. It's very fun and very available. And unfortunately, also, some of the more malicious uses of deep fakes, and I'm going to talk in a moment about non-consensual sexual images, are very available on the web for relatively small amounts of money. You can pay someone to make a, uh, a sexual image of someone without their consent. Certain threats are starting to become more common. I'm going to talk about the threats in a moment. Detection is inadequate. I'm going to talk about that. And of course, there are some fundamental physiological reasons we should be worried about photorealism we encounter, photorealistic fakery we encounter in places we didn't expect, like in our social media feed rather than in a Hollywood film. So how do we prioritize threats? So I'm going to talk about the threats that are existing and then some emerging threats. And the basis of the threat analysis that we've done is uh, both a series of consultations globally that have taken place with journalists and human rights defenders and technologists around the world. Um, and again, I want to reference you to this website if you want to look up, for example, the reports from different regions, uh, get a sense of regional perspectives on this. Uh, you'll see a range of those perspectives. Um, and we've also spent the last four years really listening very closely to the scenarios that are starting to happen. So what are the threats that you should be worried about? So um, I'm going to start with good news, and then I'm going to give you bad news, bad news, bad news. Um, so, and even I'm not sure that the good news is good news, frankly. So the good news is that there aren't that many deep fakes, uh, relatively speaking. There are a lot of what we call shallow fakes, so miscontextualized, repurposed media, conventional edits, which I imagine everyone on this webinar will have encountered. You know, the video that claims to be from one place is from another, a video that's selectively edited to remove important context. And you know, we just need to look at the Ukraine conflict right now to see that, right? Here's three videos, a couple. Uh, one is a CGI video that was passed off uh, as a real video, a computer generation. The middle one is a recycled live stream pretending to be in a Ukrainian city, but from another location. And the third was a selectively edited video of the, uh, of the Chechen tyrant Kadyrov appearing to make him say something he didn't. So even as we pay attention to deep fakes, I want to emphasize that in the everyday world of journalism and human rights, the majority of things we encounter are shallow fakes, but we have to start preparing given what's happening technologically. So what are we seeing as existing and emerging deep fake threats? Um, first, non-consensual sexual images remain the biggest deep fake problem. 
There are some statistics from a couple of years ago that indicated that the vast majority of online deep fakes were pornographic. That's a little hard to know if that figure still holds because of the growth of apps like Reface and the commercial growth. But it is undoubtedly true that the primary malicious use of deep fakes right now is to attack almost exclusively women uh, with non-consensual sexual images. And this is a threat to journalists uh, because of course journalists um, and women journalists are frequently targeted as public figures. Here's the survey from UNESCO uh, on online video violence against women journalists from 2021 that showed about 15% had experienced image-based abuse of which a significant proportion of that were deep fakes. Uh, and unfortunately that's getting easier. Um, you can access apps online that do this with photos and video. Um, and it's very problematic. And I, unfortunately there are not a great range of solutions in this area, partly because many of the questions that we might address with like misinformation deep fakes, such as we can prove it's false are often not very effective on sexual or non-consensual sexual content because it's really not about proving false. And it's very hard to do that in the, the short period in which those, those videos start to circulate as you know, the motivations to humiliate, harass, drive women from the public sphere um, don't necessarily relate to the solutions available. Um, the second threat that we see is what I'd mentioned earlier, these deep fake faces known as GAN generated faces uh, used in targeted and broad um, deception campaigns. Uh, here's a couple of examples. One, a face that was used as part of the uh, election related disinfo, misinfo around Hunter Biden and a supposed laptop, right? Turned out the laptop exists, but there were stories that use this um, fake face of a supposed Australian journalist, similarly from Ukraine here. Uh, we're starting to see this much more common in journalistic contexts, in, in commercial contexts, these fake faces that claim to be a real person, but are of, of a person who does not exist. The third big threat area is in fact the one I worry about a lot, which is what's known as the liar's dividend. The liar's dividend is when you claim true is false and force people to prove an image is not manipulated. Uh, and that is getting easier. It's incredibly easy to say when a video comes out, we don't know if that's true or false. Maybe it could be, or it's a deep fake and then put the pressure on journalists to prove it's true. Uh, we've seen incidents where the discussion around whether true or false has contributed to unrest. This is uh, a well-known case in Gabon around a supposed deep fake of the president. And then on the right, a case from the country of Georgia, where a video that was shared by former president uh, Saakashvili showing him in Georgia on the day of the elections, when he was not supposed to be there, he was facing charges, was immediately dismissed by the Georgian government as a deep fake. So we see this reflexive, it's a deep fake claim being thrown out increasingly to undermine real footage. And then the final area where we're seeing threats starting to emerge is the increasing visibility of audio-based fraud cases. Uh, what well, this typically means actually in a business setting, someone trying to create an impersonating voice to, for example, get someone to do a bank transfer, um, make financial transactions. Um, so these are the threats we see right now. We've also been doing work looking at the threats that are likely to emerge uh, based on conversations with a broad range of journalists and fact checkers and others. Um, and you know, I wanna highlight a few of those that I think are really important to think about. And I'm gonna to point to them as we talk about how we tackle and what are the solutions. Um, the first thing we've heard consistently is that the people who will be most at threat from this are probably not the senior politicians, the national level politicians, but in fact, journalists and activists who are already targeted by state surveillance, by misinformation, by attacks on their credibility, and that we really need to look at how this contributes to existing challenges for journalists who are under-resourced, not necessarily well supported with skills and tools, under attack by their own states and by civil society or uncivil society. So really, the, as we look ahead, we have to start preparing how does the journalism sector prepare for this additional burden of both deep fakes, but also the claims of deep fakery. And how do they do that in the ecosystem that exists where we know that, you know, we have this rapid digital wildfire of videos being shared rapidly on something like WhatsApp, where we're often in online video conferencing spaces like this one that are actually probably pretty vulnerable to deep fakes. Um, and where of course we exist in a climate of 
declining public trust that makes it easier to make deep fake claims and to have people believe them. So let me now talk about the solutions and how journalists fit into solutions and what's available so far for journalists. Um, so I'm going to talk about four solution areas that are particularly relevant to journalists. Um, I'm highlighting a few others on the screen that I won't get to. I'm going to talk about the question of teaching journalists and others to spot these with the naked eye. Uh, are there tools for detection and who has access? How do we build on existing journalistic skills and coordination? And are there tools for authentication? And again, who's excluded from these? So I'm going to start with the simple one. Can we teach you to spot deep fakes? And we're actually going to do this a little bit interactively. I'm going to show some GAN generated photos and see how well you, as a group of people watching this, do in identifying them. So this is going to be a fairly simple exercise. Uh, you can drop your answers in the chat if you want to, or you can just think them. And I'm going to ask you in each case, is the left or the right image the true one? Which image is the real image, which is the deep fake? So let's have a go. Which of these is the deep fake? Uh, which is the true image? Is it the left one or the right one? So if you want to, you can drop it in the chat. Otherwise, you could just have a think. So I'm going to say here, the true image is the left one. Uh, the one on the right is a GAN-generated photo. We might spot it because uh, the earring here is kind of hanging in space, maybe a clue. What about this one? Which of these is the real image? Is it the left one or the right one? Okay, if you guess the left one, you are correct. The one on the right is a GAN generated photo or a deep fake. And one way we might think about that is perhaps, you know, the background is kind of weird. Is that a forest? Is it an abstract painting? Um, the hair is a little strange at the edges here. The forehead line is a little odd, right? So maybe some clues we can see. What about this one? Is the left one real or the right one real? This one maybe is the easiest of the ones I'm gonna show you. The left one is real because uh, the uh, person here is drinking Guinness um, and probably unless you'd been training this GAN generator to generate images of people drinking Guinness, you're unlikely to have this particular picture. The one on the right is a fake. And again, maybe the clothing doesn't seem right, right? The face is strong, but the clothing is odd if we look at the clothing here on the right hand side. What about this one? Left hand real or right hand real? So in this case, the left hand one is real. The right hand one is a, um, a photo of someone who never existed. We might look at the eyes and think the, the reflection is odd, right? That doesn't seem like uh, the way in which physics work, in which the way in which their eyes are reflecting in this case, there's a little bit of distortion on the head. What about this one? Left hand real or right hand real? In this case, ah, uh, you see, I got you on this one. The left hand one is the real one. And the reason I end on this is I think it's pretty hard to tell with the naked eye which of these is real. In this case, the left-hand person is real, the right-hand person is created by the computer. And then the other thing I want to tell you is these are all examples of the current algorithmic Achilles heel of generating a photo of someone who never existed. These are all made with uh, a generation of, gener of, of photo generator about three years old. Um, you now have the ability to generate much more flexible faces. Some of these things are not visible to the naked eye anymore. Um, and in fact, there was a recent study that showed that in a test where you placed a, um, uh, an AI generated photo next to a very similar uh, real photo that humans do not have the ability to make a good discernment. 
and curiously tend to think that the AI generated face is more trustworthy than the real human face. But again, looking at these things by eye is not a good thing to do and not a good thing for the journalists to do themselves or to try and train others to spot. And I'll give you an example of why that's true is let's move to deep fake videos. Uh, there was a sort of rule of thumb that was suggested a few years back saying you could spot deep fake videos. It was easy because they didn't blink. Uh, the problem was that was just a facet of the underlying data, the way a model had been trained. No sooner had a researcher released that claim that you could spot deep fakes because they didn't blink. A few weeks later, the same researcher was sent a video that blinked, right? That's because all of these things are simply the algorithmic, current algorithmic heel of the generation process. So the first thing I want to say on this sort of solution area is as journalists and as journalists talking to the public about deep fakes, do not train them to spot deep fakes with the eye. It's not a good idea. It will get outdated quickly. Instead, what you need is to encourage media literacy. So, you know, the media literacy framework we use in Witness is the SIFT framework. Stop, investigate the source, find better coverage, trace the claims. Now, your naked eye might give you some clues within that, but it's not the place to start when you look at, for example, a deep fake or another type of video. Um, I want to move next to talking about detection. So are there tools for detection available to journalists and who has access? And the thing to know is that um, there is a huge amount of research going into creating um, synthetic media, right? At a recent conference, the ICCV, the second large number, largest number of papers in this computer vision conference were around image and video synthesis. So there are lots of people trying to think how to create um, photorealistic videos uh, and video manipulations. And so the detection work, although growing, is far out of proportion to the, the research going into synthesis. That said, there are many people working on detection. Uh, that includes big companies like uh, Facebook, who ran something called the Deep Fake Detection Challenge, and includes a range of ways in which people think about deep fake detection. And um, there are a lot of different academic and research tools uh, that are starting to be built out. I'm going to talk about how and when they're accessible to journalists in a moment, but they you know, are based on different ideas about detection, right? So sometimes you're trying to do detection based on, you know, is this digitally impossible, right? An image doesn't exist in this way. Pixels can't be created in this way. Uh, you can look at a deep fake in the same way you might think about uh, looking for more traditional forms of media manipulation. Can light reflect in a particular way? And you can also look for kind of inconsistency in an image, right? It just couldn't have happened, right? This scene could not have physically taken place, even if it looks photorealistic. And then people are also thinking about how they take the techniques I was describing earlier, that cat and mouse game, to apply deep learning, this process of really trying to use um, machine learning networks, these neural networks, to detect deep fakes. So how do you actually use the techniques that are used to build deep fakes to detect deep fakes? You also see people building tools that are about specific failures in the generation process. One of my favorites, though it's not really a leading contender to be a successful um, technology, is an approach that looks to see if there's actually a pulse underlying the deep fake, right? So a deep fake gen generally doesn't have a pulse, but if you use certain kinds of analysis, you can see under the skin of a real person, you see the pulse, right? So you're looking for the things that are not on the surface of the deep fake synthesis, but are under the surface. And then, and this comes back to who we should worry about. Um, if you are a high level politician, there's a lot of work and um, this is research by Shruti Agarwal and Hani Farid from a couple of years ago with other people working in this area, which basically builds customized models to protect particular individuals who are at high risk. And it really looks for the individual way they speak or move and then creates ways to see if a, a, a potential deep fake matches those. So I've been talking about academic research here. The issue is that on the one hand, these tools are only just starting to be available. Um, and generally they're not available to journalists. And often they have the hardest time dealing with the type of content that you and I encounter in the real world. So high quantity, low quality content, for example, compressed videos occurring in real time, going across social media platforms, sometimes where perfection is not necessary to create doubt and where we have to be able to explain it, right? So it's not okay just to say it's a deep fake. We have to explain why we think it's a deep fake. 
And most of the tools are not yet well structured for that type of uh, approach. Um, so a recommended approach for journalists to think about at this point uh, would be these three things. So I would say, first thing you should do is to look for some of these synthetic media derived telltale glitches or distortions. Um, I do think it's worth taking a look as a journalist to see if these are there. It's just not the primary mode. You're gonna spot them. Here are some examples of things you might see in both photos and video, right? Those distortions of the hairline, uh, very smooth skin, a difference between the quality of the face and the quality of the body, glitches when someone's face turns sideways. And of course, one way you might explore this is to use a tool, say something like Invid or something like that to extract a series of frames to review them. Second thing you're gonna to want to do is actually apply existing video verification and forensics approaches. Use reverse image search to see if this has existing source material. Use a plugin like Invid to look for, um, to do that reverse image search. Um, all of those things that you may think about that come out of OSINT practice. And then frankly, as these new AI tools start to emerge, you can start adding them in at the end of the process. So for example, there is a tool, and I've not tested this extensively enough on the newest generation of uh, GAN generated photos, but there is a Chrome plugin that looks for the older generation of um, fake photos. So you can just use a Chrome plugin to look for those photos. Um, I wanna highlight the other side of thinking about um, uh, detection of deep fakes, which is who has access to the tools. And um, there is a significant problem around access, right? So uh, we already see that these tools are primarily in the academic zone. We need to start thinking about how they become more accessible uh, to a broader range of individuals who are um, thinking about um, um, their need to detect as a journalist or as a civil society member. Um, and I wanna share two examples that tell us, kind of give us a foretaste about how that's gonna happening, um, gonna be happening in the next few years. So I'm gonna give you the best case example of journalists spotting a deep fake and the worst case. So you really understand that range. So I'm gonna show a best case is actually probably what happened recently if you saw the deep fake of uh, Vladimir Zelensky, um, um, which came out about a month ago in Ukraine. This was a video that purported to show the Ukrainian president um, um, surrendering. Um, and the reason I describe it as a best case is this was a video that the Ukrainian government had pre-bunked. They told people to look out for a video like this. It was not a very high quality deep fake. So in fact, it actually, to the human eye, if you looked at it, you could see, for example, the body didn't match with the head. There was some glitching on the forehead. Um, and in fact, very quickly, Zelensky himself was able to debunk it to say, it's not me. And platforms like Facebook could take it down very quickly. So honestly, the role of journalists here was not too complicated, right? Journalists could look at this. They could look at the pre-bunking. They could look at the, the work afterwards. Let me show you a different example that shows how this can go very differently though. So uh, this is an example from Myanmar in 2021. Uh, a video was released of a uh, well-known politician, Upyo Min Ten, who's been quite prominent over the last year. He's a prominent witness in one of the corruption trials of uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the de facto leader, civilian leader of Myanmar. And this was a video that came out shortly after the coup in Myanmar in 2021 was released online that apparently showed uh, this man implicating Aung San Suu Kyi in corruption. And the reason I wanna share it as an example is because what happened very rapidly, and I'll just play a few seconds of it so you can see the video itself. You know, it's not a good quality video. His voice sounds odd. He's clearly um, under pressure. Uh, his lips don't really sync up with the video. And what happened was that a range of people online said, this must be a deep fake. And the only tools that were accessible, and I wanna put a warning out for folks to be very careful about using online tools at the moment because they are not reliable to give you good results. So what happened is people put that video into an online deep fake detector and it came back generally saying, this is a deep fake. Right. And so journalists in Myanmar, other journalists in the region didn't have access to good tools to do a deep fake assessment. And this is a very hard video to do it on because it's compressed, because you don't have access to the person in it, because you don't know if it was deep faked or wasn't. Right. So you have this liar's dividend problem and the information quickly spread that the Myanmar government was deep faking 
uh, people. And the reality was that this was almost certainly a um, forced confession, not a deep fake. So a forced confession made with force, not with digital means. And the reason I show this is to point to, particularly for those of you in the journalism field, is that we really need to start thinking about how we start to resource journalists to have access to the tools uh, globally, how we think about um, providing access to media forensics that enables people to escalate cases like this one that are very high profile and how we support open access tools. Now I'm conscious of time and I wanna make sure we can address some questions and I see Paul right there. So what I'm gonna say is I'm actually gonna talk next week about an area that's actually really about kind of how journalists in a pro-social way can protect their footage and really defend it. So I'm gonna just give you a teaser as to say that next week I will integrate some discussion around tools for tracking and actually proactively protecting your footage to defend against deep fakes, what are known as authenticity infrastructure and provenance infrastructure. You might've heard of the Content Authenticity Initiative or the C2PA. So next week I'll include discussion around that as we look at how journalists proactively use ways to protect themselves against deep fake and do other things in that area. So as we finish, just want you to remember your mental exercise. Where did you place yourself? Are you still there? Have you shifted? You know, are you worried? And then just leave you with some key takeaways. So our eyes and ears will fail and deceive us. I don't want to train you to look for the glitches. Detection is not yet adequate and access to the tools is limited and unequal. And that detection tools must complement other things that we must invest in as a journalistic community like media literacy and journalistic fact checking. So I'm going to go to questions now. If you have further things you want to okay. reach out to me, here's my email and Paul, take it away. Yeah, thanks so much, Sam. Uh, that was really, really uh, intensive and uh, quite lovely at the same time. I think also fascinating, uh, especially for uh, our audience that seems to be quite uh, interested in this uh, subject. So there's a question that um, I think is important to uh, for you to take. It's from Malik. Malik is talking about uh, the impact of uh, the impact of the quality of the video. Um, in being able to identify the red flags that you mentioned. So can a low quality video, uh, can, can we still use it uh, for this purpose? Yeah, thank you Malik for that question. Low, low quality videos are the hardest and they're the hardest for much media forensics work, right? Because a lot of the things that we look for, a lot of the tools that are designed work best on high quality video or original video. And the reality is almost never do we actually encounter high quality original video, right? Even if you put it through, you know, Facebook or Twitter or uh, any, any social media network. So low quality video is hard because the detection tools don't work well. Low quality video is hard because it often actually cr creates the artifacts that people perceive as being signs of deep fakes. So for example, the Myanmar video, the glitches are probably due to compression of the video, not because of a deep fake, right? But it, you know, if you look at it and you don't know, an untrained eye might think that's a sign of fakery. So it's the tools don't work well on low quality video. Low quality video gives you false signs. And of course, in many cases, people do what's known as counter forensics, which is that you may low resolution a video to make it harder to use the tools. So absolutely, the reality is we're, we're, we have a hard time and low quality video is one of the hardest areas. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sam. There's also this question I think uh, is aligned with the latest question that is coming up, which is, um, I remember something that happened in Nigeria, uh, a video surfaced online, uh, a media, a news, um, a newspaper published a video online uh, purportedly showing a, a state governor uh, receiving bribes, I think in dollars, uh, but the governor turned around to call the video fake news that it was doctored. So uh, if we now look at it from the other angles, uh, how can, what tools are available for journalists to show that uh, their videos are not actually deep fake, they're not fake videos? Yeah, this has come up a lot and I just finished a witness strategic visioning where we talked a lot about how do you fortify your truth when you're a journalist or uh, someone else who's trying to think about defending your material. I think there are a number of ways to think about it. One is, um, you know, using some of the tools I'm going to talk about next week that allow you to have show an original show where it was created show it's not being tampered with so right like creating material that can be more easily authenticated and proven what is the original showing the changes right so if you can show that a video looked like a particular 
way in a particular moment, you can show if it's been edited and prove the changes. Um, you know, in the citizen journalism context, we often actually talk about the very basics of actually, you know, doing the things that filming, you know, landmarks, filming 360, all the things that are actually quite hard to deep fake, right? So someone claims that you deep fake to 360 video, that's pretty hard, right? It's actually really hard to do that in a real life situation. I think what you're pointing to, Paul, though, is also exactly an example of this liar's dividend that people in power can very easily say that sex video, that corruption video, it could be fake or it is fake. And then it puts the pressure on journalists to prove it's real. And that's pretty hard to do that conclusively. And we're definitely seeing that probably more frequently than actual deep fake videos. Yeah, there is this question from Janika. Uh, it was the Caribbean region in my home world is a sitting dock when it comes to vulnerability to such manipulation. Untrained practitioners, understaffed and under-resourced newsrooms, entrenched media distrust and social media platforms that are arguably more popular than legacy media. How can conscientious uh, journalists help protect their viewership and leadership when the population in general struggles with identifying even shallow fakes, that is static images and test documents that have been falsified? Thank you, Janika. It's, it's a great question. It takes me back to the reality that most of the falsifications, the deception of the moment is are shallow fakes, right? Including very simple photo and text shallow fakes. I think there's two things that it's responsible for a journalist to do now or practical. The first is to really play a role in helping support people to have the sort of basic media literacies and some of the tools that are available to detect shallow fakes, right? You know, um, you know, those, for example, the SIFT framework I mentioned, or the tools you can use like reverse image search to look for an original video or photo. Uh, I think that's one part. The second is actually fighting the deep fake rhetoric. I think in general, in many populations, people assume there are more sophisticated media manipulations out there than reality. Um, and so it's actually really important that we not prematurely create a sense that you can't believe anything because it could have been highly sophisticatedly faked when in fact the existing problem are shallow fakes and we should support people on that. And also that rhetoric on the deep fakes undermines confidence in, in existing images and video. Uh, so I would go in those two places, knowing that it's an uphill battle and I recognize that you know there's an existing problem that is already challenging with shallow fakes and uh, journalists' ability to challenge them in the public sphere. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think probably second to last question, Jeff would like to know, does witness work with any video provenance tools or technology providers. Uh, you mentioned C2PA, but looks like still images, not video. Thank you. Yeah. Great presentation. So um, Witness works on sort of two sides of this. We work on open source tools. So uh, we work on a tool called Proof Mode that is a kind of open source tool for people to easily add rich metadata to videos, hash it, cryptographically sign it and share it. Uh, that's incorporated in a number of other tools. And we work with some of the coalitions that are building these standards, uh, which I'll talk about more next week, like the Content Authenticity Initiative that Adobe launched and the C2PA that includes players like BBC and Microsoft. Um, and those are, they are currently moving from standards to implementation. And what that means is there's an underlying uh, structure that's been built around how to create, you know, ways to understand where a piece of media came from, how it was edited, and people are starting to build tools actually for photos and video in that space. And then the other space that is interesting is um, the space of people trying to think about how Web3 interacts with this. So for example, distributed ledger technologies, uh, and we collaborate with a group called Starling Project who are thinking about um, how you think about the role of distributed um, ledger technologies in verification and storage of, um, of videos to protect their integrity. Yeah, uh, can you stop sharing the screen? Yes, of course. Yes, so um, as a wrap up, uh, yeah, no, I'll just, um, I think we've had enough questions for the day. Uh, so there is this question that I also wanted to answer uh, as we wrap up. Uh, do you still think um, I, there is this two different school of, schools of thoughts regarding uh, how journalism uh, should handle deep fakes, which is um, one school of thought says um, deep fakes are not really a threat to journalism. Mm -hmm. While another says um, is a major threat. Uh, 
the last piece I read was about uh, one, two years old regarding this subject, uh, looking at the state of deepfakes and synthetic media in journalism. How do you think uh, this should be regarded in the present day journalism? Is it, do, do we, should we consider it as a major threat? I think that both those perspectives are wrong. Um, I think um, it's, it's incorrect to think that deepfakes are inconsequential because of the technological developments. There is massive amount of resources being placed into this. Uh, the techniques are getting more robust. The, the direction of travel technologically is, is definitely to make it easier to do this, more frequent, more available. So uh, dismissing it, given also what we know about how people use deceptive media and the way this starts to position itself, and knowing that it's already being used in these non-consensual sexual images, it's not a minor worry. At the same time, the kind of hype that says, this is the biggest concern that journalists should have, that this undermines every truth, as I say, I think has been premature because it also contributed to the damage. So again, for us, it's like, it's worth preparing now while still moderating the panic, right? So it will not be helpful to journalists in five years time to then panic and say, why don't we have the detection tools that work for journalists? Why haven't we built infrastructure that supports journalists globally? Why have we not prepared the public? So we really need to do that work while treading a fine line not to create a panic that implies that deep fakes are everywhere uh, and that they're the primary way in which people are deceived right now. Uh, I think I've done, we've tried. Uh, so, <laughs> so guys, um, next week we'll still be here to take more questions and uh, to get more insights uh, regarding this subject matter before we go. So um, Sam, what do you think uh, the major take home from today's session should be for journalists and um, yeah, and uh, in, a sum uh, in the summarized version, can you continue? Sure, the summarized version should be, uh, you should be thinking about deepfakes, working with your readers, viewers, consumers to de-escalate their panic, but not to give them a false hope that there's not a problem here that's emerging. You should be in your journalistic communities advocating for access to these tools and making sure they work for journalists in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Myanmar, in Pakistan, as well as in North America and Europe, where too many eyes are focused on those audiences. And then as you actually look at the tools, you should be aware your eyes are going to deceive you. The detection tools are not reliable at the moment and should be treated with caution and that there are some promising solutions starting to emerge around authenticity that could help support your work. So thank you very much, Sam. And um, we'll, like I said, we'll be back next week uh, to look at how we can positively deploy uh, these tools as journalists. So whatever questions that we couldn't get that we, we couldn't take that you still have, please and please do not hesitate to keep them coming and uh, we'll get to them next week. Join us same time uh, next week uh, for this session. And I want to appreciate Sam. Uh, taking the time uh, it was really glad uh, getting some to uh, take this session i'm really glad we are doing this and um so we if you would like to know more about the icfj's uh, uh world uh, global crisis reporting forum i encourage you to please uh check us out on Facebook. We have a very active Facebook forum and um, just go to the chat box now. Uh, Stella has put the direct link, click the link and uh, join us there. And uh, we'll, be a client. we'll be able to share the slides uh, uh, with you uh, for your personal consumption. And um, for those that are asking about the video, uh, because I think some participants are interested in taking this session as a step down training uh, for their for their colleagues. And um, we will be sharing the video. It will be live on the SFJ's YouTube page and um, probably by the end of the day of tomorrow. And um, uh, so we always post it there. And uh, if you're a forum member, if you join us on that Facebook group, I will share the video link to the video and uh, you can use it uh, for your training. Uh, and if you are doing that and uh, we would like to support you as much as we can, uh, please and please uh, do not hesitate to reach out with us uh, to me uh, if you are doing this on the uh, to train your colleagues on this subject. I will be looking forward to how we can help you uh, to be more effective on, and achieve your set goals. Uh, to learn more about the ICFJ's, uh, uh, this ICFJ's project, please check out the International Center for Journalists on www.icfj.org. And uh, we have lots of resources uh, for journalists via the IGNet uh, platform. Do not hesitate to check out the IGNet website on www.ignet.org. I can see our participants are quite 
active and are still engaging. <laughs> I wish we can keep this going, but really, uh, I would like to wrap up here and I say, have a lovely day. Sam, thank you very much. And uh, everybody, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you same time next week.